Hello and welcome to another Common Core Algebra 1 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 3, Lesson 3, Graphs of Functions. Before we begin this topic, let me just remind you that you can find a worksheet and a homework assignment that go with this video by clicking on the video's description. As well, don't forget about those handy dandy QR codes that we have at the top of each one of our worksheets. Use your smartphone or your tablet to scan that code and come right to this video. All right, let's start to talk about graphs of functions. Remember, functions come in many different forms. Included in those are equations, graphs, tables, and verbal descriptions. Today, we're going to get more practice with function notation, which we introduced in the last lesson. And we're going to look at how to use graphs and create graphs of functions. Now, it's very important, if you did not learn function notation, this and every other lesson that includes functions are going to be very, very confusing. So, be sure that you've seen a lesson, whether it's ours or somebody else's, on this whole F parentheses X parentheses thing. Alright, let's jump right into it. Exercise number one says, given the function Y equals F of X, defined by the graph below, answer the following questions. Find the value of each of the following. f of 4 equals. So remember, function notation, that 4 is the input. f of 4 over all is the output. The input is x and the output is y. So literally, when we see something like f of 4 equals, what that is really saying is, hey, what is the y-coordinate when the x-coordinate is 4? So we go to this graph and we say, well, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we go right up here. And what's that y-coordinate? That's a y-coordinate of 1. So f of 4 is equal to 1. f of negative 1, again, that's x equals negative 1. Let's see, we're right here. And we go all the way up to here, and that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. A y-coordinate of 6. All right, inputs are x, outputs are y, and let me again emphasize the fact that the output is considered the function itself. All right, so when we talk about the function, then we're really talking about its outputs. Now take a look at letter B. It says, for what values of x does f of x equal negative 2? In other words, in this case, we're going backwards. We know y is equal to negative 2, we want to know the x values. Pause the video right now and see if you can figure this out. All right, let's do it. Well, for a lot of students, what they would do is they'd come down here and they'd go, all right, you know, here's negative 2. Right? In fact, I can illustrate that really nicely. I'm going to go red here. If I take a line and I draw it across, all along the negative 2 line, right? Then it's very easy to see places, right, where I hit that negative 2. Now what I'm looking for are x values. So that's an x value of 1, and that's an x value of 3. Okay, now letter C is a very, very important problem. Read over that text by yourself for a moment. All right. It says state the minimum and maximum values of the function. Notice how I bolded them, then a bunch of these things, right? It's important. The values of the function are y values, not x values. Those are the inputs. What a function is really concerned about more than anything else are the outputs, the y values. So when you see the minimum, maximum values of the function, or anything referred to of, of the function, we're talking about the y values. So let's, let's go with the minimum. All right, the minimum value. That's got to be the lowest, right? Let me uh, actually put equals, lowest. And that's equal to, well, it's right down here. What is that lowest value? Ah, the lowest value is negative 3. So the, we might even write it like this. Y with a little subscript min equals negative 3. 
the maximum value, right, the highest value, well, let's see, that comes right at the top here, and we already counted up that, that was six. So we might say that y sub max equals six. There they are. I think the trickiest thing about this, though, is the idea that the values of the function are the outputs or the y values, okay? So I'm going to clear the text out, pause the video now if you need to. All right, here it goes. Let's keep moving. All right. Exercise two. Consider a function given by the rule g of x equals 2x plus 3. All right. Now, let's make sure before we even start with tables and graphs and things like that that we understand what this rule is doing. Based on order of operations, this rule is taking the input, multiplying it by 2, and then adding 3 to get the output. All right. So watch as we translate this equation into a graph. All right. Let's do it. Here we're going to take our input of negative 3, we're going to multiply it by 2, and we're going to add 3. I'm going to do this without my calculator. The numbers are relatively small. You should do it as well. So 2 times negative 3 is negative 6 plus 3, and that gives me an output also of negative 3. So that's a little bit of a confusing one to begin with. When the input was negative 3, the output was negative 3. On the other hand, when I put an input of negative 2 in, right, 2 times negative 2 is negative 4 plus 3. Negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1, so we get 2 negative 1. All right, what I'd like you to do is pause the video right now and finish filling out that table. All right, let's go through it. I'm going to go a little bit faster now since you had some time and you're really just checking your answers. In each case, though, we're just fulfilling what the rule says and then understanding that the input is the x-coordinate and the output is the y-coordinate. Right. So a little bit of calculation time here, sorry. But especially for me, it's more of an issue of making sure that I write well enough that you can actually see it on the screen. But I'm almost there. In some future lessons, we'll learn how to use our calculators and our tables on calculators to get these values a lot faster. But there they are. Input is x, output is y, and then we get a coordinate pair. Let's plot them. Negative 3, negative 3 is down here. Negative 2, negative 1 here. Negative 1, 1. 0, 3. 1, 5. 2, 7, and 3, 9. And now I think I'll connect them with a nice straight line. Ooh, it's red. And there's my graph. Maybe I even throw some arrows on the end of it. Right? Unless there's a reason not to, and sometimes there is a reason not to, we should throw arrows on the end of our graph. We'll make sure to discuss when you shouldn't do that. But here, we want it. All right. So we took a rule that was given in an equation form. We translated it into some table values and translated those then into its graph. All right. <laughs> Let's keep going. I'm going to clear out the text, so pause the video now if you need to. All right. Here we go. All cleared. Okay. Let's take a look at what's called a quadratic functions. Quadratic functions, which we're going to study in depth, are ones that involve x to the second as its highest power. There's all sorts of really more complicated expressions. But x times x, or x squared, is the simplest of all quadratic functions. Let's take a look at what this thing looks like. Okay. Again, we're going to translate this function rule 
right here that says take the input and multiply it by itself and we're going to translate that into a graph. So let's take a look, right? Negative 3 squared, right? Which is negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. So we have negative 3 common 9. Remember, a negative times a negative is a positive, all right? Try to avoid using your calculator on this. Negative 2 times negative 2 is a positive 4. Right? If I go with my negative 1, my hope is that you wouldn't have to write out this second step after a while, but it is important that you get it right. It's important that you do it without your calculator. All right. Reason being is you'll get more and more practice with your arithmetic. You'll get stronger with basic ideas about multiplying signed numbers. Whew. My hand is going to be sore after this lesson. So much writing. That's okay. All right. So there we have a whole series of values that we can now plot. Input, output pairs. Always, always, always. Input, comma, output x comma y all right let's do it negative three one two three four five six seven eight nine right there negative two one two three four right there negative one one zero zero one one two four Three, nine. We'll eventually talk about all sorts of things associated with a graph like this, including symmetry. Here we go. I am remarkably bad at drawing these kind of graphs because I'm trying to translate the screen onto a tablet. I suppose it could have been worse. Not much worse, but trust me, it could be. So <laughs> that's actually what's known as a parabola. We're going to get into that more later on in the course, but it's kind of a cool graph. Notice, by the way, that something that we talked about a couple lessons ago. Every input, every x value, gets only one y value, but certainly the y values can get repeated. So for instance, the 9 and the 9 are the same. The 4 and the 4 are the same. I'm going to run out of color soon, so... You know, I can only do so many of these, but 1 and 1 are the same. So it's no problem for inputs to get, or for outputs to get repeated. What we can't have are inputs repeated, okay? No, no x value that's the same having two different y values. All right, I'm going to clear this out. So pause the video now if you need to. Okay. Now, the last thing that we're going to talk about is actually quite complicated. It's what's known as a piecewise defined function. Now, remember, a function is simply a rule that allows you to convert an input into an output. Nobody says the rule has to be simple, right? It's just got to be a clearly defined rule. So piecewise defined functions are functions that are made up by combining two or more rules together based on the values of the inputs. Okay, and we'll see exactly what that means in the next exercise, but it's really kind of cool, right? It just means that we're going to combine two or more rules into a more complicated rule. That's all right. You know, we do that all the time in the real world. For instance, let's say I created a function that simply said the time that I wake up in the morning based on the day of the week. I might say something like this. Well, if the day of the week is Monday through Wednesday, then I get up at, let's say, 5 a.m. On the other hand, if the day of the week is either Saturday or Sunday, then maybe I wake up at 7.30 a.m. I'll stretch it that far if my kids will let me sleep that late. All right, But it's a little bit more of a complicated rule because the rule that you use depends on your input. All right, So let's take a look at how that works. Holy cow! Look at this. That's the way piecewise functions are oftentimes written. 
So let's try to understand what that notation means. Nothing really here, nothing to worry about here, nothing to worry about. What this really says is that whenever x is less than zero, we're gonna use this rule, two times x plus six. Whenever x is greater than or equal to zero, we're gonna use this rule, six minus x. That's it, that's how you interpret it. Now I got lots of stuff written here, so I wanna kinda of get rid of it. But every time we apply this rule, we have to figure out which of the two smaller rules, subrules, whatever, we're going to use. So f of four, all right, here's what we do. We look at that input four, and then we look at which one of these it falls into. Now, since four is greater than or equal to zero, we use this rule, right? And we just do six minus four, and we get two. So f of four is two, all right? Here though, the negative three, well, that falls into this rule, right? Because negative three is less than zero. So we'll get two times negative three plus six, which gives me negative six plus six, which gives me zero. All right. Now, that's just how we evaluate it based on values of x and based on the formula we're given. Now let's create a table. All right. So we always want to keep in mind which thing we're using. Now for every x value, for every x value less than zero, we have to use 2x plus 6. So for every x value less than zero, and that's going to be all of these, we have to use the rule 2x plus 6. Now we already kind of did it for negative 3, but let me, let me just do it again. And we're going to get negative 3 comma 0. Likewise, 2 times negative 2 plus 6 gives me negative 4 plus 6 gives me 2. So negative 2 comma 2. Let's see, 2 times negative 1 plus 6. Negative 2 plus 6, which is 4. So I get negative 1 comma 4. But now let me go with a different color. Maybe that'll help us out. Anytime x is greater than or equal to 0, we use this formula. That's going to be for all of these. So what does that formula say? It just says do 6 minus the input. That's going to be easy. So we get 0, 6. Here we'll have 6 minus 1, so that'll give me 5. That'll be 1, 5. Then I'll do 6 minus 2. That'll give me 4. So 2, 4. And finally, 6 minus 3, which gives me 3, so 3, comma 3. I'm going to go back to blue, and let's start plotting. Negative 3, comma 0 would be right there. Okay. Negative 2, comma 2, right there. Negative 1, comma 4 would be right there. Now I'm going to go back to red. 0, comma 6 would be right here. 1 comma 5 right there, 2 comma 4 would be right there, and 3 comma 3 would be right there. So let me, let me do something very quick. Let's go with blue here. Blue is going to be everywhere here. All right, let me throw a little arrow on there. All right, and red, whoop, actually go here, is going to be right here. And again, little arrow. All right, look at that. Now I will say, for the record, in case you're wondering, they don't always match up, okay? So in other words, the cutoff point, which is the zero, the cutoff point, ooh, I got a fly in the room. How'd that happen? At the cutoff point, the two formulas won't always meet up. But they do in this case, and I'm going to keep them meeting up quite a bit at the beginning when we look at piecewise functions, because they can be pretty complicated if they, if they sort of don't meet up the two lines or the two pieces, all right? But for now, they do meet up, all right? I'm going to clear out the text. Our, our little friend the fly went away, so that's good. Here we go. All right, let's finish up. So today, we looked at how to translate 
a formula for a function into the graph of a function. Possibly the most important thing about functions and graphs is that the x-coordinates are the inputs and the y-coordinates are the outputs. If you know that, then it's not too tough to do that translation either way. Okay. Thank you for joining me for another Common Core Algebra 1 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.